But isn't this uh, this new world a horrible world of violence, sex, and nastiness? Should we throw out vi Victorian values so easily, um, Dave? Um, Nietzsche said that the true path to reaching this form of enlightenment, which is reaching the Ubermensch to overcome everything, a very important part of that, he says, is to embrace struggle. He says that you should bring struggle upon yourself almost and learn to live with it and go through the several stages of becoming a camel, a lion and a child. He's saying these stages are very important stages in developing and overcoming the problems of the world. And he says that people who believe in the superstitious ideas of religion are actually, he's saying they're haters, haters of the body. He's saying that these people believe that the life we're living now is just purely purgatory for our afterlife. And uh, he's saying this is the wrong way to believe that life is, and he's saying that we should embrace our life as it is now, make the most of it, because every action we do in this life will echo in eternity, because he believed the idea of the eternal, eternal recurrence. <coughs> so he believed that time is not finite. Everything must repeat at some point. Um, as to the idea of, of, is this a horrible world that, that we live in? Um, maybe, but th this is this is exactly the kind of idea that we're embracing. It, it's, it's always looking for the truth. Um, the old way of thinking was, was always looking backwards, looking at, um, and, and maybe looking through rose-tinted glasses. You know, you look at old Renaissance paintings and it's, it's all about perfection. It's all about perfecting the human form. You look at new things and it's about looking forward. It's about looking at, the ugliness of the world and, and you know maybe taking off the rose tinted glasses and accepting th things for the way they are and as, as uh, David said this is what Nietzsche was was trying to do and this is in a, in a sense maybe what Freud was trying to do as well you, you can't necessarily deal with a problem until you can see that it's there until you can see that we're um, basically animalistic how on earth can you ever overcome those kind of instincts that might be holding you back on your journey to becoming the overman as Nietzsche would say talking about the um the instincts and um urges of um, man as a beast you could say and uh reading ulysses by joyce i can't help but um draw um direct parallels between um, work that stretches far back before that um starting from the um the romantic era where you've got um russo who's uh, proclaiming that we should um embrace the passions and um defy society and um then you go on to uh nietzsche who similarly he th he believes that we should um we should uh, deny what Christianity tells us um, about um, sex, for example. He believes that um, the physical form it should be something that we celebrate, something that we um something that we obey ourselves. And um, this also <coughs> connects to um, Freud, who um, obviously has a very um, a sexual perspective on things. His um his uh, psychoanalysis uh, psychoanalysis of um, this kind of behavior reveals that we are innately sexual creatures. We, um, we, we want to embrace this through um, the concept of the id, but the superego, um, uh, which I guess you could say is um, a representation of society, tells us not to, and then the ego in between, basically um, it mediates that. But um, o overall, um, what's um, told within Ulysses is, um, that we're cons we're in a constant battle. It's a constant struggle, as um, Andrew said, and um, this is something that we should be embracing, like like our bodies, like like sex, and just basically be enjoying it and be striving for the right answers. Um, thank you, Seb. Uh, but can't we see anything wrong with modernism? I mean, uh, most people think that Freud and Nietzsche and Joyce are great, but you know, aren't they just madmen? Well, um, everybody loves a madman, um, but uh, I think some of the most um, eccentric um, personalities uh, throughout um, human history have actually come up with the um, the most fascinating and most groundbreaking ideas. I mean, I was just uh, thinking to myself earlier, um, people refer to um, crazy people uh, with the, um, the phonetic sound of a cuckoo, and I just uh, went off on a tangent, but I thought, well, hang on, the cuckoo is uh, one of the smartest uh, birds in the world. It um, knocks out the eggs of um, another bird's nest 
and replaces it with its own and that's that's utterly fantastic that's um that's just a brilliant inge um, ingenious thing so how can um somebody who's you know who's cuckoo be um entirely crazy why we sh should we ignore those people mm. thanks Seb. the fact of the matter is sorry just to expand on that slightly is the fact that we it's inescapable the fact that we do live in a freudian world his legacy is always going to live on in in this time anyway because although as andy was saying many of his ideas have been challenged scientists say he's not a scientist it's too vague we do live in a freudian world in that the whole psychoanalysis idea was basically spawned by him if you pick up any any trashy magazine there will always be some form of psychoanalysis within these magazines saying do this quiz and we'll see what kind of person you are. That's very Freudian, summing up someone's, you know, personality in a few aspects of their actions in some ways is a very Freudian thing. He thought he could pigeonhole people, well, not pigeonhole, but he, he liked to explain the way people, expl uh, people behave by their actions, and that's a very Freudian thing, mm -hmm. and we do very much so live in a Freudian world still. Mm. What about you, Andy? Do you, don't you think that, you know, Freud, Nietzsche and Joyce were just evil? I mean, Joyce's novel is just no nice read sometimes. Well, um, anybody who, would, who was able to take a completely modernist approach would always be considered a madman. And the reason being that modernism is about not sticking to rules. It's about not, um, not doing what you're expected to do. In a sense, you know, to tie it in with Freud a little bit more, you're almost trying to shed your superego. It's your superego that prevents you from, um, from going crazy and having sex with everything and, and that, that kind of stuff, doing things that other people find unacceptable. So if you're able to do that, if you're able to take a modernist approach, shed your superego and then go, then go forward with, with new ideas, Anybody without a superego would be considered to be mad because they're not sticking to rules. So, so of course, they'd be considered madmen. But then again, Freud also made it very, very clear that the way that you perceive yourself and the way that other people perceive you are completely and utterly different. So, you know, is, is madness an idea of, is it about perception? I think the way we um, the way we perceive other people um, from ourselves is uh, that how it depends on how we interpret um, what is good and what is evil. As um, Nietzsche, um, one of the titles of his books, it, one of his most famous works, um, Beyond Good and Evil, and um, it, he Nietzsche actually he perceived um, evil as a just thing. He saw it as um, why why shouldn't I be evil? I'm doing the thing that I want to be doing. If a, he actually, um, within um, within, within um, one of his books, he uh, he praises the man who uh, murders another man and says, well, I wanted to do it, so therefore why can I not pursue um, my end goals? Why should I listen to society, the um, this controlling superego that has been um, superimposed onto my thoughts? That it's completely not necessary. As um, Andrew has mentioned, you know, you should really, you should really think about what you're being told and what you actually want to do and maybe we shouldn't be spending as much time think considering what other people want us to be doing I, I think you know beyond good and evil the, the title of the book says it all really it's, it's not so much about saying that evil's a good thing it's about saying that there is no such thing mm. um, good and evil Nietzsche would have said are um, human constructs they're, they're ideas that people invented to um, to keep order and one of the key ideas of, of modernism is that of a decentered universe. There aren't any absolutes. To say that this is definitely good and this is definitely evil is, is a ridiculous idea. What Nietzsche is saying um, is that you should, you should just be who you are um, and don't expect things to never change. It's about ev everything's always in flux. And we, we've seen that with James Joyce's book. I mean, now, um, you know, people kind of maybe think that it's maybe a little bit embarrassing to read out loud or something like that but it's not too bad at the time it was considered shocking um, immoral blasphemous and all of those things so that's that's a perfect example of, of a decentered universe things being in flux we're not we're not the middle of the universe the universe is always moving the universe doesn't have a center 
in the same way we can't expect things not to change in any way. Doesn't that moral relativism, relativism lead to a complete anarchy? That would depend on whether you took a Hobbesian approach or a Rousseauian approach, I would say. Um, if, if you were keen on Hobbes's ideas, then you would say that, yes, it would. Um, if you took away all these kind of restrictions that, that we place upon ourselves, the ideas of good and evil, um, then, yeah, we would all be killing and eating each other and raping each other and fighting each other for, for every scrap of food and every piece of land. If you were to follow Rousseau, Rousseau would say, no, that's actually the, the right way to go. People would work out their own order and people would stop fighting over things because we wouldn't have any land to fight over, um, as, as John Lennon suggested in Imagine. So, um, you know, that's whether or not that would lead to complete anarchy um, or, or to complete chaos is, is an, an argument that's been going on for hundreds of years and I prob we're probably not going to solve it right now. Um, can you all sum up what modernism means to you? Um, well, I'll start. I'll, I'll finish as I started, I guess. Um, modernism is is about refusing to let rules um, and, and old ideas prevent you from um, from being creative and from living a full life. Um, it's about looking forwards and not looking backwards. I think you can take it too far. I don't think there's anything wrong with learning from the past. I think um, we, you know, we should look, look backwards occasionally. Um, but ultimately, I think that, that modernism is a good thing. A lot of the reason that we've had all the progress that we have had in everything from film and, and music and architecture and entertainment and anything else that we can come up with is due to modernism. Um, just quickly, Seb, can you... Can you um, tell me what modernism mean to you? Means to you? I think um, modest, modernism, in concise terms, is just is the birth. It was the birth of um, free speech, uh, freedom of expression, and that is what it is given us today. It has continued that on. I think it's it's only in a modernist society that we can actually have such leaps in science and things like that. If if we were still living in a world where it was completely controlled by religion, everything we thought that happened was caused by God, it would be very hard for scientists to work without persecution. And I think it's, it's modernism loosely has led to great developments in the human race as a whole. Medicine, science, physics, everything. Modernism has played a massive part because if it weren't for modernism, they, scientists would be persecuted.